Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to give this talk. And I want to tell you today a bit um, about the current project that we are working, uh, that I'm working on with uh, Javier Redondo, who's my PhD supervisor. And I want to tell you a bit about um, Global Action String Loop Decays and um, what the next steps are to, to reach the continuum limit in these simulations. Because as we have already seen in plenty of talks in this workshop, um, there is still a lot of lot of active research ideas ongoing, and we want to make some progress on that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just um, as we have seen many introdu many introductions about axioms in this workshop, and then still a lot of talk, so I'm going to be very brief on that. Just to make sure that when I talk about axioms in my in my talk, uh, I refer to QCD axiom, so the axiom that solves the strong CP problem, and the central question of my research is basically the same as, as what Kenichi was discussing before uh, today, is that we want to understand the properties of the QCD axion and determine its mass or give a precise prediction for its mass. Because as we all know, um, even if there's a lot of progress on constraining the, the allowed parameter space for the axion, uh, we have still plenty of possibilities and experimental experimental searches could, could use a hint. <laughs> um, exactly. And um, we all love the post-inflationary scenario because it is exactly the scenario that allows us to give a precise prediction for the axion mass. Um, and that's why we are studying the axion in the post-inflationary scenario. But as we have seen, there is a price we have to pay to work in the post-inflationary scenario and to have the possibility to make this axion mass prediction is that um, we have to deal with topological defects, especially with uh, axion strings. Um, that are very complicated to deal with uh, due to many different reasons. And so we are doing numerical simulations of these string networks um, in order to make these predictions work. Additionally, we also have, have domain walls. We also had a talk um, about domain walls um, at this workshop. So, so I will not comment much on that because that's the later stage of the evolution that we are looking at now. And you have seen already some kind of similar plot. So that's the usual, usual setup we see in our simulations when we begin. And we have the, the field values of the axon that are randomly distributed between minus pi and pi. And then we see quite naturally we have the Kibble mechanism information of these strings. So I think you cannot see my, my point, but that's not, not too important. Okay. Um, yeah, that's quite a typical network evolution, uh, quite a typical picture that we see when we do these simulations. And um, exactly, and the strings in the simulation are exactly the points that are that are surrounded by one wrapping of the field values in that case. And uh, I borrowed this picture, or at least part of this picture from, from Kenichi. Uh, he showed it in his talk today before. And we know that for our numerical simulations of the string network, um, the main problem is that we have a huge hierarchy of scales that makes these simulations extremely complicated to, to do, which is mainly due to the fact that um, that we have a huge separation in scales between the, the intrinsic length scale of the string cores, which is related to the radial mass, MR in this case, and uh, the Hubble scale, which describes the uh, roughly the uh, separation between the different strings, as you can see in the graphic on the right. And what we also see in this overview is that in general, these strings appear in very funny and <laughs> very characteristic shapes. So, the idea is why we study these string loops first, or in general, these individual strings is, of course, um, we might we might get some information about the radiation of the different types or characteristic types of these strings, which will later help us to interpret the results of the full network, as the network simulations are way more complicated than simulations of individual string loops. And this is the main motivation of, of um, studying the, the radiation or the, the axon emission from individual strings and string loops. And uh, there are a few typical shapes that you usually usually see when you when you follow the data around that. On the left, I provided a somehow you know, more or less complete list of references that studied uh, string loops in various shapes and and settings and setups in most in numerical simulations, and where a lot of progress has been made. And for the talk today, I will I will focus on the following shapes that I that I that I presented as so also screenshots from the simulations. That I'm going to talk about, 
And we have a circular loop, which is yeah, some of toy model because I've just seen uh, the, the chance of having a perfectly circular loop in your network is <laughs> it's almost vanishing, I would say. And then we have uh, randomly shuffled variations of the circular loop. So we we uh, we extended our, our code library to, to be able to do that, uh, which would look something like the second the second picture to the left. Then I, I had a look at loops with we have kings. Uh, kings are regions of very high curvature. And they are you know, they are very interesting in terms of the axion emission. And uh, what we just started recently looking, having a look at is long strings. And so here in this picture, so the fourth to the right, as you don't see my, my pointer, um, would be an initial condition with two long strings where we have one straight string and one string that is that is um, like sinusoidally displaced from that. And we would like to see and simulate what happens there. And the last case was a special case that we had a look at, um, which is a, a special uh, family of solutions, um, elliptic solutions. They look like elliptic, we'll see it later when I'm gonna show the movies, and some short animations uh, that have been studied by Vilenkin and Vajas Party a few years ago, um, and which rely on a, on a family of trajectories that are solutions of the equation of motion that, um, yeah, look like ellipses and are therefore relevant for our study. And they found, found interesting results. We want to reproduce those results. And so, but how do we, how do we um, construct the action field around the string? Because of course, now that we are, we are, um, we are away from these network simulations, we, we need a way to, to correctly provide uh, initial conditions for our simulations. And the way we did this, or we do this in our code, is uh, that we make use of the Kalpamon axiom duality, which is given by this. Oh, now you could see the, the pointer, um, um, which is which is basically characterized by this term. So we, we couple axiom field to a to an anti-symmetric tree form, um, and what's nice about that is that this gives us a super nice analogy between um, the axion and uh, actual electrodynamics. So we'll see on the next slide, I try to visualize this a bit more, but in principle, um, our task is to solve this Poisson equation like um, equation where, where in the lower, lower in, the, in the current term, um, the y's are the, are, the, um, are the coordinates of the string, parameter sigma, which is the, the uh, FE parameter on the world sheet and its velocities. So in principle, we couple the Kalpermon action to the number go to action of the, of the string. Um, and this allows us of solving these, this um, equality numerically will allow us to construct the axion field on an arbitrary shape string. And the nice thing, as I said, in analogy to electrodynamics is that if you do the math, and this is, you know, it was quite some calculation, um, you end up at a relation that looks, some, let's look like, looks like this. So you see we have a relation for the gradient of the axion field which is related to some curl of the of the uh, of the string coordinates, and this is quite analogous to what we all know, or what we've all learned as the Biot-Savart law, right? So we have we have Bio -Savar where we have like a a current carrying, um, yeah, we have like a current, and we describe the magnetic field around it, uh, following the Biot-Savart law. This this formula that we obtain here in this limit looks very similar. This is like why it's a very nice analogy, and from this gradient we can perform numerical with this. With this relation, depending on the, the shape of our string, we can perform numerical integrations to compute the links, uh, the links uh, between two two parts of the of the full plane where we have our string, and um, this is basically what we implemented in, into our code um, to do these numerical integrations. So for every kind of shape that we put into our code, this is like a typical initial condition we generate. Um, we can compute via this nice Kalpermon duality, can compute the axion field um, around the string, which serves as initial condition for our simulations. So what we see here is, uh, I marked it in white, which is just like um, just the same initial condition as in different coordinate planes. So to, to mimic the 3D. And yeah, and you see, um, this is how the axion field around this elliptic, elliptic string would look like. This is one of those. Uh, burden trajectories that I was talking about before. And yeah, as I said, um, I just wanted to quickly shout out our, our code that we are we are using for these simulations because it has been 
used for many of the simulations that we have seen during this during this um, conference. So, for example, Giovanni gave a nice talk about applications of, especially Kenichi gave a talk about like the main main motivation why this code was introduced by Javier and Kenichi and Alex. So yeah, um, and it's publicly available. So for all of you who are interested in working on getting started on working on action string simulations, uh, I suggested to check it out. Giovanni and I are actually working, uh, started working on, especially Giovanni started working on making a, a website so that, that people can use the, the code more, um, yeah, more easily. And we are also planning to put out, put out some, some kind of manual at some point. Okay, and for the circular loop, there's been a lot of, a lot of discussion. Um, and nowadays we are mostly sure that the spectrum goes on okay. And um, I play here the animation to play, perfect, this works. So we are studying the, the circular loop as a perfect toy model. Um, and of course, this animation is not, not very ideal because you see, it seems that there's a lot of radiation going on. This is because I normalized the scale to make it more visible. So uh, the, the, re the, relevant, the relevant plane for radiation would be the other plane around, but you will see this later for the other initial conditions. And so what we did is we, we initialized the simulations of the, of the string loops and compute the, uh, compute the, the, axion, the axion spectrum um, at the end of the simulation, so after the loop has collapsed. And um, what we do is we try to try to um, observe this one over k behavior or see if it's different if we go to larger simulations. Because as you have seen in the, in the, in the references that I was highlighting, most of these, most of these papers is uh, ground groundbreaking papers for this for this um, for these kind of kind of studies were already quite old. So numerical simulations were not possible in the tanks in the to the extent that we can we can do them now. So our goal was to to like continue um, to continue these simulations to larger scales because now we have more computational power and can can test the power of our code for these toy models. And for the loop, we can perfectly, or we, we see this one of our K behavior is typical, but of course, yeah, the circular loop, as I said, is not really the most interesting, the most interesting example. And that's why we also studied, uh, studied a bit more interesting shapes. For example, we have this, this a bit more distortion loops, or, um, which already see it changes how the, how the spectrum looks already. And um, we tried a, quite a few of different shapes to see, to see how this affects the spectrum. Um, especially interesting is is like the case where we have kings, which are these regions of extreme curvature that you could see here. Go back. Yeah, that also, as you see um, here, are the dominant give the dominant contribution to the radiation after the collapse of the uh, of the of the loop. Um, yeah, so so we studied all of those different cases, and. As a side as a side project, we started this this burden trajectories that I was talking about. Um, so this is like a specific family of trajectories that solve the equations of motion and that that provide us with these elliptic initial conditions that you have seen. And here, a and b are the same as if you a and b are just just the two functions characterizing characterizing the, the shape of the string. Alpha and beta are two constants and psi. And psi is a parameter that allows us to shift this ellipse uh, in the plane. We'll see that uh, in the following. And why was this so interesting? This was one of the first, first um, papers that claimed that uh, for these kind of strings, the radiation power scales not perfectly as 1 over k, but somehow as 1 over uh, k to the power of 4 thirds. And we wanted to reproduce this in uh, this specific case, and we, we, were, we managed to do that. And at the moment, so since we just started this, I, I did not plot all of the results, but um, I studied a whole trajectory of those slides, and we see that for different for different um, orientations, um, the spectrum slightly changes, but we were able to reproduce, roughly reproduce this form of for uh, free spectrum. Now you could see this is probably the better plane to display the radiation. Um, because now we really see how the radiation goes, goes out of, of the loop after the collapse. Um, what is currently a little bit of a work in progress because we just recently started is the, uh, is looking at long strings. Um, they make up about about so there are studies, for example, in the, the works by Gorgetto et al. 
that Kiichi was also referring to, that roughly 80% of, uh, of all of our, our, um, our axons are in, in these long strings, right? So it's very important to understand how these long strings behave and how the, spec uh, how the spectrum of long string radiation is. Um, I, I, yeah, if we just started, I don't, I won't show um, a spectrum of that. But of course, um, one of those cases that you have to consider with long strings is that they form loops in the end. So they are one of the one of those. This is one of the standard mechanisms in the in, that you observe in the network that causes us to have loops. So uh, if you check the animation, you will see this. Now, the original intention of the simulation was to have a oscillating long string, um, but the setup is not not ideal yet in that sense. So what happens is because they they are too close, so we need the two strings. Oops, we need the two strings to cancel the boundary effects because of course we work with periodic boundary conditions and um, with an individual string this is not yet very ideal. So we have these two to cancel these effects and. Uh, Instead of having the oscillation oscillating string, we immediately see um, the, the collapse of those two strings. So they, they, they get in touch, form a loop, and also this loop decays. And you can see, as before, this loop has two regions of very high curvature um, where a lot of axon emission is produced. So also these long strings are quite quite complicated in that sense. So when I when I summarize this, so this is just the free spectra we've seen before. Um, the idea is that now that we have this, this framework where we can do very high resolution simulations of these spring loops, um, we, we want to study in great detail these, these individual components of the string network uh, in order to, to make more sense of, of the spectra that we observe when we do the network simulations, uh, where the newest results are probably those that Kinichi presented us today. And yeah, but still, we have to be very careful when doing these simulations because um, what we want to do in the end is we want to reach the continuum limit of the simulation because sure, um, on the one side, when we do when we do a simulation, we are somewhere somewhere um, bounded by on the one side the, 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 the volume effects. So we are simulating in the final simulation volume. We have boundary effects in, on the periodic uh, from the periodic copies and whatsoever. So the idea is um, to make our volume large enough to avoid all of those effects. So this is what I want to visualize with the two boxes on the left. And on the other side, of course, as we have discussed today, we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of discretization effects, especially uh, later in the networks when, when like the, this, uh, the, the resolution shrinks. So we lose the, the resolution of the screen cause if we don't use um, methods like adaptive meshes. Um, yeah. Um, so we have to be careful in, in resolving our physics well enough. So this is this is what we have to have in mind. And that's why we have to do many simulations in all of the directions. So we did three directions. We just studied volume effects at very low, very low, uh, very high discretization. We studied um, discretization effects at a very, very high volumes. So to be in the in the lower left corner of the diagram. And we also try to take the direct limit of uh, going from that yeah, don't go in diagonal diagonal direction. So at the same time, um, decreasing discretization effects and volume effects, which um, now to work quite okay, but we want to make sure that this is the right way to do it. So that's why we supplemented this study with uh, the other two limiting procedures. And as you can see, this plot uh, looks very horrible because we observe for these for these individual string simulation at the at the precision level that we are currently working with very strong um, volume effects. So what you can see here is the spectrum as before, but uh, we plot it as a as a function of the radius uh, normalized to the radius, so that we can get rid of the uh, that we have the same physics for the same curves. But we, what we do is is we change the radius of the initial loop. So those are alpha circular loops. Um, so we start with a quite large loop in the volume that is of course affected by by volume effects, and then we try to uh, to shrink down the loop. So we use the same initial condition, but shrink it down and uh, redo these simulations to see uh, to see how this stabilizes the, the spectrum. And you can see, for example, here uh, that the last curve is already the last curve, which is the curve with the highest uh, with the with the smallest smallest uh, volume effect, already loses a lot of these these characteristic shapes that we see here. 
Um, the same we can do for the discretization curve, which already looks a bit better. So we have it better under control. So um, what happens here is, is we fix fix the string radius, but then we, we tune the, the number of grid points and the volume and everything such that the physics that we simulate is the same. And we try to, to match the spectrum um, and try to see if there is some kind of convergence. And and the volume and everything. So what this, this is fine, this works, but you have to be careful. And we see that there is still already some kind of convergence in that, in that diagram, but still in the UV, we are heavily contaminated by the volume effect. So they are very strong uh, at this level. And they also they are the dominant source of the contamination of the spectrum, um, at least for these string simulations. I mean, we have today we have seen a very extensive study of uh, by Kenichi on all of those different kinds of, of errors that you have to have in mind when doing these large scale simulations. So this is, I would say a good, a good playground to uh, study these effects, to study these effects on these individual loops. And yeah, and now what the, the ultimate goal would be is that we, uh, that we, we, we make, we find a converging solution for the spectrum for the, the approaches and um, increase the systematic studies of these different effects um in order to under really understand what's the continuum limit of this of this spectrum uh, for the circular loop one way would for example be to get to go to very or to to reduce the numerical complexity by a lot would be to make use of the spherical symmetry like for example only simulating the one of the quadrants because in principle um this should be enough to recover all of the dynamics um and in general of course um some point we want to go to the network so we are we still have this issue of the uh, limited dynamic range so what we what would be the goal is or what could be is of course always you can go to lower simulation more powerful supercomputers in in the on the level that we are we did now for the loops this is still possible because we are not yet at these large large um, grid size so we are you know, those two our simulations roughly about 1500 bit points um not, not not very small compared to the to the eleven thousand cube that Kenichi was talking about for the network. Um, this was Also, we are not yet <laughs> that good at producing fancy IMR animations as <laughs> as multi showed us yesterday. So, um, as we have seen, the idea of adaptive metrifying is that we want to use the computational power or to focus the computational power on specific parts of the grid. In our case, um, around the things. and adaptive maps are perfectly reasonable to do that because there we can define criteria to look for the strings and really refine the string course. And they are, these techniques are usually used in large scale cosmological simulation codes, also in engineering applications and also And we have seen yesterday that there are, there are, there's much progress on these network simulations with adaptive mesh, um, with adaptive mesh simulations. And also um, the code we are using at the moment was developed by Bodo Schwabe and collaborators. And they used, uh, originally they developed this code to study fuzzy dark matter uh, halo formation. And um, we had, oh, they adapted and integrated uh, the possibility to study axon string networks. And this is what we are going to do in the next, next month, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, the general idea is I created this plot once um, for an earlier talk. The idea is that uh, even even if we would have like the perfect supercomputers or the the curves, the black dashed lines here are one of the most powerful supercomputers that we have today. And the other curve would be if we would build our imaginary supercomputer by connecting uh, connecting all of our laptops. If we assume that that everybody has a laptop with some kind of 16, uh, 16 gigabyte of RAM, um, and even yeah, you can see that. Um, even 
even if we would have these computational resources that we will never have for, for our simulations, we could not reach the, these high tensions that we need or these high, uh, these high resolutions that we need, would need to uh, resolve all of those string dynamics at, at um, according, uh, according, yeah. And so what AMR does is, uh, allows us to to lower these limits a bit, so to to get us further. And as we discussed today, Maltese said they they are already a bit further than than the largest static grid simulation with their AMR, even if they they don't need to use like a eleven thousand cube base grid, but it's it's enough to use. When I remember correctly, it was something like two thousand plus these refinement limits and focus the computation power only around the string. So I made this little made this little calculation to visualize that. And yeah. Now on the right, you can see a screenshot of one of our AMR simulations. So this is, yeah. Also, uh, one thing why we like these, these string loops is because they are good. They are good playground to learn the AMR because um, learning this is, can be quite complicated. There are so many competing effects and you have to, to optimize, optimize already quite well to, to make the, the simulations very efficient, especially for the next. Use a nice spectrum in time. So uh, I, I just gave you this one that I have, which is a simulation of 512, 512 base grid with two levels of refinement of a factor of two each, which means around the string, um, as you can see around the string, we have the higher resolution. And around the string, we are at something like 2,000 uh, grid points. And those simulations run way faster than, than uh, when we had to run a static grid 2,000. Um, 2000 cube simulation. So yeah, uh, with that, I come to my conclusion. So as we have seen in many of this, this conference and uh, um, that we need to understand uh, the global axion string dynamics in order to make a clear prediction for the axion dark matter mass in the post inflationary scenario. And in order to do that, we have to, to make the best simulations that we can do. And in this, in this, And the next step um, to go in this direction is now getting to, to work uh, getting to work with these AMR simulations um, and increasing the dynamic range. And of course, go to the full network, um, improve these simulations and make use of what we learned from the individual string loop decays um, for the interpretation of results for the spectra. And with that, I thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, happy to answer questions if there are any. Great, thanks. Uh, um, please, questions? So there's a question by Kenichi, please. I see you. So Kenichi, you want to ask? I can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> uh, okay. So Matthew, uh, thanks for the very great talk. So um uh so uh, could you uh, go back to the slide showing the summary of the the spectrum from various configurations? Uh -huh. I think it yeah. is uh slide fourteen oh. or fifteen. Yes, I just stopped full screen. Let me go back. <laughs> this one, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay. okay, it's still scrolling. It's a bit. It's a bit slow. Let me go back. <laughs> oh my god! Why is it so slow? Yeah. I think Kino doesn't like too many videos on the slides. <laughs> um. Well, No, it should be, should be there. This one, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
And so, um, so do you mean that these these results are free from the volume effect? So volume effect um, no. already ruled. No, I don't. I don't think so. The spectra looked much much uh, cleaner. Um, so what we did is this was yeah we did to study these different shapes. Uh, what is what we started really recently? Is I, I tried to recompile like um, some benchmark simulations for for this talk today. Um, so they are not really really high resolution. They are around there are thousand cube simulations with MSI 0.5, I think. Um, and there are I tried to to make uh, so from learning from the result that I showed you for the volume effects, I tried to be in the regime where I. Um, where I saw that the spectrum is not heavily contaminated with the volume effects. So if you if you remember the plot of the volume effects, I showed you the large spectrum basically didn't show these heavy um, features in the UV, and I was trying to make sure that I'm still in this in this uh, in this regime. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, okay. I I don't know they are not they are definitely not perfect because they are not large simulations, but I think they should be reasonable, reasonable in the sense of volume effects. Yeah. Okay, so 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 the what what is the value of the Q from this uh, spectrum? Is Q is greater than okay. one or smaller than one? Ah, exactly. So so um, what we so we can reproduce this Q equals four to the three for this for this trajectories that I check and Q is close to one for the for the circular loop, which is the blue curve here. So you see um it's it's steeper for the for the other two. So still close to one but but not not exactly one. And this is why I really want to understand this and go to larger grids to to see what's the final result for the spectrum. Okay, thank you very much.